and five, we're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia, as part of the World War II Veterans History Project. I'm David Lowence, and we have with us as our guest today the Honorable Dan Yates, Jr., right? <laughs> who's uh, one of the golf legends of Atlanta, along with his brother and son, and uh, he has interesting stories to tell about growing up in Atlanta in the East Lake area, playing golf. Uh, where he was on Pearl Harbor Day. He had an unusual job during the war that he'll talk about and he'll integrate it along with the history of his family and golf. And Dan, Danny, we're just delighted to have you with us today and appreciate so much your honor us with your presence. Well, thank you, David. I grew up with my two brothers and sister at East Lake Cross from the East Lake Golf Course. I was born out there and so was my sister. My sister Fran's 89. I, my brother Charlie will be 92. I think September the 9th. And my younger brother, Alan, who died about a year ago. He's three years younger than I am. So we were three years. I'm 86. Fran was 89. Charlie's going to be 92. And my younger brother was 83. But we grew up right across the street from the golf course. And every day why we'd be over on the golf course if we wanted to leave trying to get ball golf balls out. But but my brother Charles when he was fifteen would start playing with Bob Jones would invite him to play. And I used to take along behind him and see how they did things. So I've been playing golf all of my life and I never have taken a lesson. Mr. Jones told me one time, he said, Dan, there are two things you're going to you have to remember when you're swinging at a golf ball. He said, the first thing is, you never think about more than one thing, and the thing you do think about is stay behind the ball at all times. So I grew up thinking about that every time I hit a golf ball, and fortunately, halfway decent for 50 or 60 or 70 years. So. But I'm still here, so I'm just delighted. Never a lesson. No, I just never took a lesson. I just, we lived right across the street from the golf course, and then by 1930, they built another golf course, which we call the number two course, that it was built about 1930, which was right behind our house. So across the street, one golf course was, and behind the house, it was the other. So we'd be on one of the golf, golf courses the other, just all the time. So, But I'm fortunate to be here. Uh, I just didn't have the opportunity to do much fighting in the war. Uh, I was in East Lake on Sunday, December the 8th, playing in what they call the dog fight. And we came, when we got back to the club, all the radios were blaring what had gone on at Pearl. Harbor. So my brother Charles was drafted into the Army in April of 1941. And I don't know how he did it or what he did it, but as soon as Pearl Harbor came along, he got transferred from a private army to an incident in the Navy. So I went to, I flew over to Charleston right after Pearl Harbor, trying to get a commission in the Navy. But I wasn't a very big fellow then. And you had to weigh 132 pounds to get in the Navy, and I weighed 120. And they would uh, weigh five pounds, but I never could get to 127, so I couldn't get in the Navy. And a few months after that, I, w I enlisted and went to any aircraft off Kansas School in, at Camp Davis, North Carolina. But unfortunately, I hurt my shoulder a couple, couple of times up there and, and got fortunate enough to go down to the University of Florida to administrative school. And I really had tough duty. I was down there for three months. And my first station, I got transferred to Georgia Tech 
they had a, a special program there, and I was an instructor. And I stayed there about 10 months and then went to Camp Butler, North Carolina for a while. And then the government, late July of 44, they were bringing troops for rest and <coughs> renovation. And they'd taken over all the hotels in Asheville. And I was, had the tough day <laughs> going up to the athletic recreation office and I stayed up there nearly a year and a half and and was gotten out of the army there at Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. So but my brother Charles, talking about him, he went from a private in the army to a ensign in the Navy and he was he was up at going to Annapolis until radar school. And I know that then he was stationed in Charleston and was got to know Mr. Jack Kennedy pretty well. But Charles went out on a destroyer called the Mayo, I think number five twenty two, and they were hit uh, at Anzio above the waterline and a whole lot of the soldiers, <coughs> sailors were killed but Charles wasn't hurt. And they took the, the boat into Naples and to dry dock and they got it where, where it would float but they didn't repair the engines. And they took a tug and towed the boat, the destroyer from Naples to New York. It took them 31 days and they called themselves a sitting duck. So they went to New York and they repaired the destroyer and then he went into the into the Pacific and he was there on Tokyo Bay the day that the fighting was over. Then I had a younger brother named Alan, who was three years younger than I am. He got drafted into the Marines and was stationed in California, then he went to Hawaii. And then he was in on the first wave at Iwo Jima. And nearly, nearly about a hundred percent of the, the ones in his company were casualties of some sort. But Alan fortunately got through Iwo Jima without any problem. He picked up a, a Japanese officer's sword, but had all sorts of diamond pearls and them. And he carried around a few days, but then somebody offered him $15 for it, so he sold it. The next time he saw that, that sword was on the boat going off, and the fellow he sold it to sold it to somebody for $1,500. <laughs> so Alan went back to Hawaii, and they were loading off to go to invade Japan when they dropped the atomic bomb and Allen thought the President Truman the finest fellow in the world for dropping that bomb. So so he was over in Japan for a few months when we occupied it and fortunately he didn't get hurt but he said you wouldn't believe how many people of ours would got killed the way it was fortified. So but I'm just I'm fortunate to still be here. Uh, I tried to get in the Navy and I wish I had it, but they didn't qualify me, so I know they would get shot at like my two brothers did. Danny, what, uh, what was the mood of the country back in the 30s while we were pretty much isolationists prior to December the 7th and Pearl Harbor and what? Well, my brother. My brother Charles had won the British Amateur Golf Tournament in 1938, and in 1939 he went back over there to defend his title, and he was with a Mr. Danforth, who rented a plane and flew him all around. And he said they'd go in 1939. They'd go in these beer parlors, and all the all the Germans just happy and laughing and having a good time. 
And he just was completely surprised when, when Pearl Harbor happened. But I just think it was such a big shock to all of us. I can remember going to the movies uh, in 1941, in the summer of 1941, and you see these movies, and the war was going on with the Germans, and and we just, I really never did think we were, didn't think too much we were going right into the war, but when it happened, it sure did happen. Charlie joined before Pearl Harbor days. He sure? was drafted into the Army mm -hmm. in 1941, okay. in April. And his first day, he was down at Walter Robbins, right outside of Macon. He was in the finance office down there. So he was down there from April 41 to, I guess, January of 42, because he immediately somehow or another got transferred into the Navy as an ensign. And he was communicate radar officer on the destroyer for a couple of years. And he just said, <laughs> he said every time he went out to the Atlantic that water was so rough that he just, he just couldn't, he would just get sick as a dog. And my mother used to send him cases of collard greens. He loved collard greens. And mother would send him a case somewhere and he'd stack it under his bunk on the ship. And, but he was, he said a lot of the people on his boat at Angel were killed, but he fortunately didn't hurt, get hurt like a lot of the sailors did. You all had won a number of amateur tournaments before the war broke out. Uh, what happened to your golfing careers during 1941, 1942 to 1945. Well, I was, I was playing pretty good in uh, 1941 and two, and I was stationed up in Asheville. I was, I played in six tournaments from 42 to 45, and I happened to win all five of them, and six of them rather. And after, after the war. I played in four tournaments and runner-up in all four of them. And then I got married and didn't have any money. <laughs> Soon had two children. And it's not, uh, you can't compete with these fellows playing all the time and you're working, maybe getting to play on Saturday. So I'm just fortunate and I really quit playing in tournaments in 1946. I did play a couple of tournaments after that, but I had to work for a living and with two children to raise in pretty. What year was young Danny born? Danny was 55. He was 55 in May. Okay. So he was born in 1950. Huh. And Danny's best friend he was growing up was Tommy Barnes' his son David. When he was about 12 years old, Danny would kick, we were living it. At Brookhaven, which was just a quarter of a mile or so from Peachtree, and Danny go up and catch a streetcar downtown and transfer it onto an East Lake car that stopped right in front of the clubhouse. So Danny, during the summer, used to play golf with David Barnes, who at that time was probably the best junior amateur golfer in the country. He won he won that one national junior tournament when he was 16. But he went to Florida and Danny went to Georgia. So we just sort of lost contact. We I'd see Tommy and his son, his son brother Pete. We'd be out East Lake after the war playing golf every Saturday. How many uh, amateur tournaments has young Danny won? Well, he won the, he won three U.S., I mean, he won, he won three Georgia State Amateur Tournaments. He won the Southern Amateur. He won the U.S. Mid-Amateur. He runner up in the U.S. Amateur. He, he won three or four Georgia uh, Mid-Amateur. But Danny had a good uh, career. He's played in all the U.S. GA's 
uh, tournaments except the U.S. Senior, and he's going to play it next month. So he was on two Walker Cup teams and captain of two. Played on the U.S. World Cup team. He was runner-up in the U.S. Amateur in 1988. So he got to play in the Masters tournament as runner-up in the U.S. Amateur and as a winner of the U.S. Mid Amateur. So he's he's played in the Masters tournament twice. But Daniel's 55 and he still tries to beat heads <laughs> with the young players, which is pretty tough. What do you think the state of the country is in 2005 compared to 1940? Well, we, we weren't fighting anything. And I, I graduated from Georgia Tech in 1941, and I was making $100 a month. And I went in the Army, and I was ended up as a first lieutenant. And I was making a little over $100 a month. So, first car I bought, I bought a, a 1944 that had 8,000 miles on it. And I bought it on my birthday, which is December the 8th, the day after, day after Pearl. Pearl Harbor. I drove that car all during the war. And after the war, I bought a 1946 Ford Club Coupe. And I paid fifteen hundred fifty-six dollars for it, and I sold that nineteen forty-four on a used car lot for enough to buy the new car. That's how tough it was to buy a new car. You couldn't get a new car in nineteen forty-six. I used my office was with Bob Ison in the insurance business, and we'd go by Boulder Ford to lunch nearly every day. And I'd go in there every time I went by and say, when are you going to let me have a car? So I finally got one in October that year, and it immediately got stolen. <laughs> but fortunately, they recovered it in Oklahoma City, so they brought it back to me. But things were different. You could buy a suit for $20 or $30. It uses John Gerald. And things were just different after the war. We bought a house in 1951 on a street called Dean Drive, which is on on the right off of Howell Mill Road. It was a creek. We paid uh, $22,000 for it. I sold it five years later for $20,100 and bought a house across the street from it the Capital City Golf Club, but those houses over there, that house would go for four or five hundred thousand dollars now. Sure. That's how much things going up. We we paid thirty five thousand dollars for our house on Westbrook Haven Drive. And then all the lots are gone and they they're paying a million dollars for a house and tearing it down. So <laughs> things are just different. What was Western North Carolina like in 1944? Were you part of a rehab center up there, or was it no, just the recreation entirely? Or? The government, in, 19, in the summer of 1944, had taken over all the hotels in Asheville and a couple of golf courses, and they were bringing troops back from Europe for two weeks rest and recreation. And I got stationed up there as an athletic recreation officer. And we operated out of the Grove Park Inn, which was the most expensive place I'd ever seen. <laughs> so, well, we had all sorts of athletes, yeah. and we had uh, entertainers, musicians, actors, and we used to put on shows. The government had taken over the city auditorium in Asheville, and we'd put on shows every week. Might be most of them were musicals because we had great musicians, and we had a lot of Major League Baseball players with us up there. So I just happened, not on any of my doing, I just got transferred up there in late July of 1944. 
and we had these two golf courses, and we had six golf professionals in the Army that were working under us. So, but as I said, it was, it was tough duty while I was up there playing golf with these fellows, and everybody else would get shot at in Europe and, and Asia. But, so they were up there just for R&R? &R. Right, that's all they were. Primarily. The and I, I never will forget, this captain came out of the Grove Park Inn one day, and he said, gosh, this is the first time I ever paid seven cents for whole main lobsters. We had the same chefs up there, and he'd eaten the rations for dinner was 50 cents, and he'd eaten seven main lobsters. So, <laughs> but it was, it was just tough duty. Yeah. So I was fortunate. I didn't have enough points to get out of the Army to get point for each of And I'd been in maybe 45 months or something. You had to get 85 points to get out. And I ran into this captain at the PX up at when I was in, in town in Pennsylvania, and he said, aren't you Dan Yates? And I said, yes. And he asked me what I was doing. I asked him what he was doing. And he was in charge of getting the officers out of the Army. So I said, could you get me out? So he said, if you'll get released from your command officer, I will. So I couldn't go find my CO quick enough. And got a written note that I, he would release me. So, that was in February 1946. Both you and Charlie had quite a bit of notoriety because of your golfing ability. Did that single you out in any way during your tour of duty? Well, as I said, uh, Dean Griffin, who was Dean over Georgia Tech, was uh, a naval reserve officer and he got me an appointment over in, over in Charleston and I went. But my brother Charles, he was going to the Naval Academy taking some radar courses and he was playing with this major general named Floyd Parks. <laughs> and General Parks asked me where I was. and. In 1938, my freshman year at Georgia Tech, the Tech golf team went to Columbus and played the officers club down there. And Floyd Parks was a second lieutenant. And now four years later, he's a major general chief of state for ground forces. So he had orders written to me to go to the uh, anti-aircraft officers candidate school up in Camp Davis. North Carolina out of Wilmington. So I went there and I went through that thing and just about the end I hurt my shoulder for the second time and they kicked me out. So I called Charles and asked him, was he going to see General Parks? He said, yeah, I'm playing with golf with him the next day. So I told Charles my problem that they washed me out of the anti-aircraft officers candidate school. And I asked him to tell General Parks my problem. So General Park had uh, General Somerville, who was the chairman of, of personnel in the Army. He called the commanding general down at Camp Davis and told him his office to Private President Daniel Yates, Jr. to go to whatever officer's candidate school he was qualified. So I got transferred down to I went down to Gainesville, Florida and went through the administrative officer's candidate school. And then, as I said, my first stop was an instructor at Georgia Tech, and then from there to Camp Button in Durham and then over to Asheville. So all the other fellows, I mean, they had just so much terrible duty. I kidding, they told told one of my friends after the war, I said, gosh, y'all don't know how tough I had it up there in Asheville. I said, one day I had to play 36 holes in a golf tournament and then play a double head of softball that night. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just kidding, but, but that's just what happened. 
Charlie was in Tommy Barnes's wedding. I'm in sure the military, was. I think, down in Miami. Down in Miami. They had reconnected over in Charleston. Mm -hmm. uh, got transferred to Miami. Tommy was down there in Anaki. And that Charles was stationed and going to school up at Annapolis. And and Charles had, Charles came home on leave from up there in 1944 in May. And Charles and Dorothy Malone were married. So they got married in May of 1944. At the time I was stationed here in Atlanta. I recall reading in some of the articles I've read about you all that one of the things your father was most proud of was not your golfing ability, but the character of his voice that he thought stood out. Can you talk a little bit about his influence on your life, all of your lives? Oh, Daddy was a hard-nosed little fellow. He was must have been five feet, four or five, weighing 510 pounds. He played golf left-handed. And he just didn't, he just didn't want him, his children. My, my sister was a great swimmer, and she won a lot of the southeastern uh, swimming meets. But Daddy didn't like uh, women athletes. So when she got about 16, Daddy made her quit. So my younger brother and I started out in the insurance business. Daddy was in the wholesale dry goods business, and during the war all of his salesmen got drafted, and all of his things that he sold were rations, so he couldn't get anything to sell, so right after the war he just closed his business, and my younger brother and Alan and I just moved in his office to go in the insurance business, sell every fifty or hundred dollar policy we could, and Daddy would come down to the office at 7 o'clock every morning. And the first thing he'd say, let's go get a dope. And that's what the old folks called, that's what your father would have called, a coke call, a call it a dope. And we'd go across the street at 7 o'clock every morning, have a fountain coke. And then we'd go, Alan and I'd go out trying to peddle insurance, and Data would stay and answer the telephone, go to the bank, post office, and give us a terrible time if we, let anybody owe us money. So that's how we got, but Daddy, Daddy was, they said he'd been in the wholesale dry goods business. He moved here, the oldest of either 15 or 16 children. I thought 16. My sister said 15 from Ringo, Georgia. So, and then he went to work for somebody and ended up buying the business and he had a company called Ridley Yates. And the president of Capital City Club last year, Ridley Nichols, his father, his grandfather and my father were partners in Ridley Yates Company. R Ridley Howard? Yeah, Ridley Howard. Ridley uh, Howard. Yeah, Ridley, Ridley Nichols is up the street. He was a cousin. Okay. But Ridley Howard, yeah. But Daddy said he played golf every Saturday and Sunday. And there's no way that he played during the week. He didn't believe in us. Plain taking time off. He just saw we ought to work. My brother Alan got away with it. I didn't. I wouldn't have dreamed to go out and play golf during the week. But Wednesday, Thursday, Alan was out there. But I know that our father was, he was well respected in the Atlanta community. And he and some of them, like Mr. Patterson, they lived in a place called the Bell House right after the turn of the century, which was a, a boarding house down near the Capital City Club on Harris Street. But Daddy just believed in hard work. And so that's, that's what, <laughs> that's what, he meant what by, I thought I had to do. That's what he meant by character. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't dream of going over playing golf. Tommy Barnes and some of them, they played a lot of golf. And my brother Charles was the same way. Daddy didn't think he ought to be playing any golf. Charles was working at First National Bank and had the big title of 
assistant vice president. And then Charles went to call himself a rag peddler, went with this company and sold cotton goods. And then when Charles was 60 years old, uh, Mayor Ivan Allen talked Charles into going, being head of the art museum, the high museum and stuff. Charles was a great fundraiser and got Mr. Woodruff to put whatever millions of dollars building behind the museum. I married a lady named Margaret Shepard, whose family has been in road construction in Georgia since before World War. This is great. Well, I said my wife, Margaret Shepard, family was in the road construction, the Shepherd Construction Company, and they built roads all over Georgia. And during the war, they built bases out of the country. I know they built Glencore, Blimp Base down in Brunswick. But they've been in business, gosh, 75 years, or more than that. I think they went in business about 19, 15, 16, 17. So oh, he's been in business 80, 90 years. And there's a hospital here in Atlanta. Shepherd Center. Which oh. was started by her nephew and right. his sister-in-law. My, my wife's brother's son, James, was hurt in a surfing accident. He, after he got out of school in 1973 from the University of Georgia, Three of his friends include Frank Carter's son, who was the real, big real estate here. And they, Mr. Carter chartered a boat and they traveled the Mediterranean for a month. And then they traveled around the world and somewhere they learned to body surf like you were in these big surfboards. So in 1973, right out of Rio, he got crushed riding one of those raves, got crushed in the ocean floor washed up, drowned, and some of his friends revived him. And the shepherds were very close to Senator Herman Talmadge. They were right next to him. So they got Senator Talmadge to get a, get a medevac, Army, Air Force medevac plane to go into Rio. I think it cost them some $60,000, $70,000. But uh, he went to Piedmont and he just, when he was at Piedmont Hospital, all he could do was drink one eye. And they took him out to a hospital out in, called Craig Institute down in Colorado and they got where that he could walk with a cane. And so they were impressed that what Craig Institute could do for him, they decided they were going to. Atlanta Shepherd, his mother. So she worked very hard and raised an awful lot of money to first they called it the Shepherd Spinal Center, but they changed it to the Shepherd Center. And they've just really, from what I've heard, got his final facility as in the country out there. You know more about that than I would. I don't think there's any better. Did a Marion Williams Peacock go up with you all at East Lake? Not Does that name ring, ring a bell uh -huh. to you? And did you know Colonel Jones, Robert Jones? Colonel Bob Jones? Yes. Oh, I knew. I get Colonel Bob and and my brother Charles and Paris Harris was pastor at the First Methodist Church. They played golf with the Colonel and his son Bob Jones every Saturday. And the story that Charles tells is one Saturday the Colonel, gosh, he was very vocal, threw clubs and cuss, and he'd had a particularly bad day. And they got to the 16th hole out of East Lake, and the Colonel hit the ball in the trap off the tee and got it in the trap in front of the green and screamed and hollered. And Bob had shot about a 65 that day, so as they were walking off, Pierce Harris, the preacher, said, well, Charles said, the only thing I can say is that we should have known better. 
And Bob Jones said, what do you mean you should have known about it? He said, this combination of proficiency and profanity would be too much for us. <laughs> I've heard Charles tell that story a lot of times, but that's a true story. That's but the Colonel was a great fellow, and then the Colonel and Bob played golf every Saturday. And after the war, and before Charles went into the service, why, well, he played golf with them every Saturday. I would just stand the game. They, the stakes were the First National Bank, where Charles worked against First Methodist Church, where he preached the priest. <laughs> So each one I met equally deep pockets. Oh yeah, the Colonel was he was a great fellow. He really was. Did you ever meet him? I never met him. No, sir. Never did. Well, as I said, I used to tag Blom for the time I was nine or ten years old, so I just was fortunate and grew up in an era where Bob Jones and he was I mean, he couldn't have been better than us kids. He take us in the clubhouse and buy us a coat and help us with the game. So he just ordinary felt like you and I sitting there talking. And that's just how I grew up uh, around Mr. Bob Jones. How do you like the new East Lake Golf Course? No, oh, I think it's great. Tom Cousins has done a magnificent job out there. They told that they had the Ryder Cup matches out there in 1963. And they had an architect come in and change the course all around. And they just ruined it. To most people like myself that had grown up playing out there. And then Tom Cousins bought it about 10 years ago. And they had that old housing project over there on the number two course, which nothing but Drug City. So Tom bought the club and got uh, Reese Jones to come in. I know that we, I had several meetings, Charles and Tommy Barnes, and I met with them because we played the golf course, the old Donald Ross course, but they couldn't find the original plans. And so I know that I had several meetings with Charles and Tommy and uh, Eric Ball, who was, was assistant professional back in the early 30s. And I had a fellow named Woodrow who worked in the bag room uh, repairing the clubs and stuff. So, so we, he did the best he could. The course is a lot better than it was in 63, but there are a few changes. I wanted them. The seventh hole out there was a dog leg left. Yeah. But they couldn't, they couldn't go like it used to be. Most people didn't even remember it that. I say must have changed it. 75 years ago, but they were having the practice team. They were hitting balls up that way on the new, after they redid the course, so. But the course is in great condition, and it's owned by the Cousins Foundation, and, and they want 100, uh, corporate members, they've got 97 right now. But the course is in magnificent condition and the clubhouse is better than it ever was. But it, I just think Tom Cousin did a great job. Oh, couldn't have done any better. How do you like having a Charlie Yates golf course next door to it? Well, it's an honor to Charles. When Tom first, uh, when he bought it, he, he wanted Charles to be president. And Charles said, well, you've got to either be captain or chairman, because I, I, I work under you, but but I, you name me as cap, as president of the golf club, and I don't, in Charles's health, I guess he has probably changed it. But they've got great people out there, and Ray Robinson has done such a good job. It's sort of overseeing the thing. He was, I guess he was head of IBM or somebody here in Atlanta. How do you like the first tee program? No, I think, I think they've done a great job. I, the only thing I've done is give, give a little money to it. Danny gives 
so much of his time to golf. He really does. He was, uh, he's, I think, probably second in command on the tour championship that they'll have out there first November. He's gives a whole lot of his time as president of Peachtree Golf Club for a couple of years, and he was head of the championship that uh, they had out at the new second uh, second course on Capital City a couple of years ago. But he gives his time very freely. He's really involved in golf. Not that not that he doesn't, he's in the insurance business with me and has been since 1973. But he works every single day. And if he's playing in a golf tournament, why? If he's playing 36 holes, he always calls office between rounds. And that's just the way he is. That's great. And he'll be at the office on Saturday. And he'll be there after church on Sunday. So, uh, Daniel would take after what my father would be proud of. What other remembrances do you have of the Atlanta growing up experience, World War II, and afterwards that you'd like to reminisce about? Well, <coughs> as I said, I was, I didn't, of course when you're in the Army you just get transferred where you <coughs> were, but I had a lot of friends, a lot of close friends that were killed. I was, Margaret goes to this lady that fixes her hair once a week, and her husband, Ernie, he was a glider pilot and landed on at Normandy. And I think everybody on his, on his glider was killed except him. Mm. I saw him with a friend of mine Monday night who was captured twice right after Normandy. But who was that? Sam Hodges. Okay. You know Sam? Oh, I know the name. He was a general contractor and he's retired. Sam's about three or four years younger okay. than I am. But things were just different. Gas, you had a hard time getting any gas. You had to have a ration ticket for tires. I had a, I had a chance to buy a tire that was about new. And just in case I needed on this 1944 that I have. And I had this, we were living, I was living with my mother and father out of East Lake. And Daddy just took that tire and contributed to the war effort without telling me. Have you seen the country as unified since World War II as it was during World War II? I don't think so. I just think you have a lot more complaints about yeah. what's going on in Iraq than they had during World War II. Everybody was just right together, yeah. as far as I could see. And as I said, I was, I was stationed, I lived for a, a few months before I went to the service, and I was stationed here for six or eight months. Uh, during the middle of the war, and I was up at Asheville, and I mean the whole—I mean the whole country was just blended together, as far as I could see. Probably the last time that we've been that unified in our feelings about any cause. Well, I mean, a lot, a lot of people don't like what's going on. <laughs> I just think that President Bush knows a whole lot more than we do. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I just don't think he'd be sending troops over there, just be sending them. Yeah. My sister lives at St. Simon's and Griffin Bell, you know Griffin, don't mm -hmm. you? He was in first President Bush's office <laughs> and first President Bush said, said, gosh, where'd you, where'd you get that uh, good, good suntan? And Griffin Bell said, well, we got a house at Seattle, and I played golf. And ex-president Bush said, well, 
I spent my honeymoon at Sea Island and said, how about let's get in an outing town. <laughs> so my sister played golf with Barbara Bush, who just started playing. And then she flew out to out to Texas to the Bush library and they played golf out there. And then uh, two or three years later, Barbara and George Bush came back to Sea Island and she played golf with them a couple of times. <laughs> then flew up to Nashville with them, but she just think Barbara Bush is just the greatest thing in the world. I was over to the British Open at a, at a Royal Ancient dinner one night and first President Bush was there and I, I introduced myself to Barbara and she hollered, hey George, come over here, Fran's sisters. <laughs> so, but, and then a good friend of mine was exec on the sub that picked up uh, Mr. Bush when he was shot down. And I asked, and he was down to walk the cup matches in 2001. And he was at a dinner and I asked him, did he know that Dean Spratlin had died? And he said, yeah, I talked with him. And Dean was exactly. the executive also on the sub that picked him up. So he said, yeah, because I talked with his son yesterday. You know, Jack Guy, he lives here in Atlanta, was yeah. George Bush's roommate on the San Jacinto aircraft he carrier. Was. I haven't seen Jack in a long time. But they uh, they had a lot of stories to tell. Well, talked to Jack about it quite a bit. He and Dean Spratlin developed Hunt Cliff and Cherokee Golf yeah. Club side by side. Yeah. Neither one of them knew, the other one knew George Bush. And when they went to the christening of the ship named after the president, they walked down to the VIP section and saw each other and said, what are you doing here? And they said, I didn't know you know George Bush. And they're, each one of them had, had a very intimate relationship with him and neither one of them had ever talked about it to one another during the time they were developing Hunt Club. Well, they just, I was talking with Arnold Palmer at one of these senior tournaments mm -hmm. and they had it at the golf club of Georgia. And I was walking, the, walked a few holes with Winnie Palmer and it was right after Labor Day and she said they'd been up of visiting with the president, or oh, Maine, wherever it is. Kenny Bunkford. Kenny Bunkford, and he said that, that uh, I guess, what is it, the Secret Service that looks after him? I guess so. And he said the Secret Service uh, had wanted him to go take a nap. And he was, he had invited Arnold to go out on his speedboat. And so Wendy said, well, he wouldn't take up now. Said in five minutes he'd back down <laughs> on the speedboat with Arnold. <laughs> so, but the game of golf has been so much to the Yates family. Charles knew. Uh, Mr. George Herbert Walker, I guess he is a present great-grandfather. So. So Charles knew it, played golf with him. So we've just been fortunate that we've lived in the right time in Atlanta, just like your family. Well, I think the game of golf can be equally proud of its relationship to the Yates family. Well, I don't know. If we we just always done the best we could, and sometimes we won, and most times we got beats. <laughs> well, Danny, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to you for the interview. Number one, number two is. Even though you didn't see active combat, you were willing to do what needed to be done to help us get through World War II. You were willing to see your brother go overseas and be shot at and expose himself to harm's way. And on behalf of my generation and the generations that come, we want to express our sincere appreciation to you. I sure did. Thank you, David. Thank you. It was great.